So while, um, while I clear all this out, has anyone heard of zero knowledge proofs before? Hmm. Okay. Ellie Barber Cave. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fun example. Um I wish I I wish I'd thought of like introducing some fun examples, TM, but um if you if you look at the Wikipedia article, there's like a bunch of cute um like non-crypto examples. This is one about uh Where's Wally, which is pretty spicy. Um so alright, here's the deal, right? We often want, um, when, when we deal with security in the modern world, uh, we, want, we want servers and clients to prove things, okay? So, you may not be, this may sound like a strange statement, um, but you'll see that it, it, it's kind of something that we automatically, we just automatically take into account. Um, so the classic example, I mean, the most obvious example is a user needs to prove that they know the password, right? So if you're logging into account, an account, if you're getting someone to log into account, they have to prove that they know the password. And it, it's kind of a strange way to think about it because they just send you the password, right? But um, they do have to actually prove that they know it. Um, by sending you the password, they demonstrate that they do actually know the password. Um, you can also think of a pin, uh, a pin used at an ATM as another obvious example of the user pro proving they know the pin, which is basically just a password. Um, so a web server needs to prove that any, a web server needs to prove its identity, at least it does in 2020. Um, and it does that by doing, oh, now you know my email address, that's cool. Um, <laughs> so they're gonna do this, hang on, let me just. <laughs> let me just go ahead and shut that up. <laughs> hmm. I don't know how to do that in a sensible way. That's fine. I guess we just get to read my emails now. Um, okay, so Web7 needs to prove that they have, they have the private key for their certificate. And that's kind of more interesting because obviously they can't just send you the private key because then you know the private key and you can sign a bunch of stuff. So um, this idea of a digital signature where a server that you connect to um, computes, computes a hash of some kind um, and then uh, encrypts it with its private key and then you can decrypt it with the public key and check that it all checks out. Um, this kind of idea is sort of the most basic um, application or the most basic place where you'll encounter um, a proof where you're trying to hide some secret information, right? So you've got some secret information and you want to prove that you know this secret information, but you don't want to, you don't want to reveal the secret, right? So how is someone going to ask you to demonstrate that you really do know a secret without you revealing anything about it? Um, it's kind of, it's kind of a magic trick, right? That's, that's the whole title of this. And we'll see, we'll see later on that there is some really wacky stuff going on um, when you try to think about exactly what this means. You know, what does it mean to know something? What does it mean, what does it mean to, um, like, how can we be sure that when we prove a fact, we aren't revealing any other information? How can we be sure that, say, when we, when we sign, when we digitally sign, um, when we digitally sign something, how can we be sure that, um, we didn't inadvertently reveal something about the private key? So these are all quite subtle questions, right? Um, another, uh, so... Cryptographers introduced this idea called a zero knowledge proof. Um, and this comes from late nineties, early noughties. Um, and it's currently become a really active area of research. So, um, for example, and this is where, um, half my audience is going to cringe. Um, 
a lot of blockchain technology relies heavily on zero knowledge proofs. And if you think about it, this makes sense. Uh, what are you what are you doing like in, in in the classic Bitcoin protocol? What are you actually doing when you mine a block? You're you're saying, hey, I found a number where if I add it to the information and hash it all, I get this particularly interesting uh, pattern of hash. So it, it all dates back to this idea of proving knowledge. And because each block contains a hash of the previous block, it's recursive and you prove that the whole thing was valid to begin with. Um, a lot of modern blockchain texts have taken this idea and extended it a whole bunch. Yeah, okay, so um, someone in chat suggested exactly what I'm about to talk about. How can you prove, how do you prove that you know a secret without revealing any information? So, um, I talked about this, I talk, we talked about this password thing, right? How do you prove that you know a password without revealing the password? You can't just send them the password because then they know it. So another, another area, something a little bit more interesting is let's say that Alice knows a public key PK and a private key SK. And Bob wants to check that Alice knows the public key, uh, the secret key. Hey, SK, <laughs> nice. Okay, so Bob wants to check that Alice really does know uh, the secret key corresponding to her public key. And of course, Alice doesn't want to reveal anything about that secret key to Bob. So we engage in, we can think of a nice simple protocol to try to do this. Um, Alice sends Bob her public key. Bob, Bob comes up with a random message. It can be anything you like, the longer the better. Bob comes up with a random message, we'll call it C. He's gonna encrypt that with Alice's public key. So this notation here is just saying, we'll encrypt it with the public key PK. And then Alice is gonna decrypt it with her secret key or her private key and send the result back to Bob. Wow, I forgot how to write the letter B apparently. So this is, we have this like nice three step protocol where Alice is gonna prove that she really does know the private key corresponding to the public key. Um, and hopefully this doesn't reveal any information about the private key, right? And, to, and indeed, for any reasonable um, system, um, this is not going to reveal any information about the private key. And this is something called a, no, a, a known plaintext attack, where somehow by knowing something about the plaintext and looking at the encryption, then you learn something about the private key. And obviously that can't work for an asymmetric system, right? Because you can always, you can take any plain text you want, encrypt it with the public key and see what it looks like encrypted. So obviously your system has to be able to deal with this problem. So we can be pretty confident that assuming the crypto works the way it's supposed to, Alice has not revealed any information about her private key. And importantly, Alice really did prove that she knows the private key because unless Bob, like Alice has no information about C other than the encryption. If she doesn't know the private key, she must have just guessed it. So she must have been really lucky to just happen to guess the message that Bob sent without, without actually knowing the private key. So this is, this, this is what we're going to call a zero knowledge proof. Okay. And the idea of the zero knowledge proof is I've got some fact. In this case, the fact that we're proving is I know the private key corresponding to the public key. Um, we're going to get a challenge and we're going to respond to that challenge. And our, respond, our response is going to guarantee that we really do know the corresponding. Um, uh, we really, the, the fact really is true. The thing we're asserting and usually we'll know some kind of secret really is the case. So I want you to kind of take a moment, think about how the message passes between Ellis and Bob. It looks kind of like this, right? Um, if you squint your eyes in exactly the right way and add another couple of lines here, it looks kind of like the Greek letter Sigma, right? So we call this a Sigma protocol and I'm not making this up. The reason it's called a Sigma protocol 
is because the shape of the messages looks kind of like a sigma. That is the only reason. Don't get distracted. Um, there's no deeper meaning for this. Um, so we call this a sigma protocol, this three-step procedure. Um, it's a particular class of zero-knowledge proofs, and it's one that is quite easy to study and um, think about. So it's what I'm going to focus on today, okay? So this is called a sigma protocol. And the way it works is, first of all, Alice is going to send a commitment to Bob. How does Bob know the public key sent in the first place was true? Well, it doesn't matter, right? The, the fact that we're proving um, is whatever public key that Alice sends Bob, Alice really does know the corresponding secret key, right? Or private key, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, so this is a really interesting point, right? Here, Alice is choosing what she wants to prove. She's choosing a public key, right? And she's proving that she knows the corresponding private key. So you don't know, um, you don't know what context the public key is useful in, right? You don't automatically know, oh, this is the public key that was used in so-and-so an encryption. So there's no extra context here. It's just saying, um, whatever Alice, whatever public key Alice said she had at the start, she definitely knows the corresponding private key. That doesn't tell you any, that doesn't give you any intelligence, if you like, about exactly what that key is being used for. So in step one, we're going to say Alice sent a commitment to Bob. You don't know it was Alice. Oh, okay. So um, you're saying, right, yeah. Um, so we, we'll, let's assume that out of band, Alice and Bob are certain that they really are talking to each other. Um, the, pr the proof is not, the proof does not prove identity. It only proves facts, right? So this proof does not assert anything about who Alice and Bob are. So let's assume, you know, they've got a TLS tunnel of some kind. They're confident, uh, Bob, Bob really is, Bob, Bob is confident that he really is talking to Alice. Um, but that's a good point. It's, there's no extra context here. So first of all, Alice sent a, what's called a commitment to Bob. And second, Bob sent a challenge to Alice. And third, Alice sent a response. So it's this three this three step protocol that we call a sigma protocol because of the pattern of the messages. Um, and I'm going to use the symbol T to mean the commitment. I'm going to use the symbol C to mean the challenge, and the symbol Z to you to mean the response. Um, these are just the ones that a particularly cool textbook uses. So T for commitment, C for challenge, Z for response. Um, and we can think of a conversation, right? A conversation between Alice and Bob. And the conversation is just the, the, the values T, C, Z. Um, for, some, for some fact, right? So this conversation is um, supposed to be a proof of some fact. And we'll say that the statement or the fact that we're asserting to be true is why, okay? And we'll also say, we've got something called a witness. So the witness is um, the smoking gun. The witness says, this is the actual um, value that I, this is the secret that I hold. And we'll say that's X. These are the symbols that we use throughout. So in the case of this thing that we saw here, the commitment was the public key. The challenge was the encryption of some message C, and the response was the corresponding plain text C. The statement was PK, I know the public key PK, sorry, I know the corresponding secret key, and the witness was the, was the private key, okay? So this is a general structure um, that you can apply over and over again, and I'm gonna look at one more particular type of Sigma protocol but there are heaps of these out there. If you read the literature, there are, there are lots and lots of variants on the same basic idea. Alrighty. So with that under our belt, um, let's do some maths. We all love maths, right? Um, so unfortunately, we are gonna have to lean on some mathematical ideas just to really, con just because otherwise the things we can prove are kind of not very deep. We get to, to really get anywhere interesting, we're gonna have to introduce some mathematical ideas. So um, in case any of my audience hasn't come across this before, um, we've got something, I think it's something called the modulo operation. So we will write 
Uh, there's a question. Oh, good lord. Uh, we can come back to that after the talk. So there's a question. Um, so we have this operation called the modulo operation. Okay, and we write n mod p is the remainder It's the remainder of n divided by p. Okay, and we call this the modulo operation, n mod p. Um, if you're used to programming, the modulo operation is often written percent. Um, no particular reason for it, it's just a symbol that we don't really use otherwise. Um, so for a concrete example, um, 5 mod 3 is 2, right? Divide 5 by 3, it's 1 with 2 remainder. Or 7 mod 4 is 3. Now, we can also do addition, right? Mod modulo, whatever we like. So 5 plus 7 mod 3 equals, well, it's 12 mod 3. Which is, what's the remainder when you divide 12 by 3? It's 0. So we can do addition modulo 3. We can also do multiplication modulo 3. So 5 times 7 mod 3 is 35 mod 3, which is 2. Okay, so we can do addition and subtraction. Um, um, we can do multiplication. A natural question is, can we do division? And the answer, it turns out, is only if p is prime. Okay, so that's why I've used the letter P here. You can only do division if it's modulo a prime number. So what you might be going, what the hell are you talking about? How can I divide five by seven um, and somehow get a whole number out of it? Like, what, what does this even mean? Well, first of all, notice that if I, if I, apply the modulo to each of these, so 2, 1, I get 2 plus 1 equals 3, which, um, 2 plus 1, it's 3, which is 0 mod 3. So I can do the modulo before the operation and it's not going to change anything. So let's try doing this here. 2 over 1 mod 3. Huh. That's just going to be 2, right? So it turns out um, that if p is a prime number, you can always do some kind of trick like this. There's what we call a multiplicative inverse. So if p is prime, for, for all a, there's, there's some number x such that ax mod p, so let me write that more clearly, ax mod p equals 1. Okay, and this is kind of like, um, this is kind of like in the real numbers. Um, we think of the, well, we can write 2 times 1 over 2 equals 1, right? So we can say 1 over 2 is whatever it is, whatever number it is, when you multiply by 2, you get 1. And it turns out that if p is a prime number, you can always do this, okay? Um, the reasons why are a little bit subtle. Um, they're really interesting if you read up on them. But for now on, we're just going to assume that we can go ahead and divide mod a prime number, okay? So I can always do 5 over 7, say, mod 3. And that's neat. That's because 3 is a prime number. Remember, a prime number is only divisible by itself uh, and 1. And that's kind of one of the main reasons that we care about prime numbers in cryptography. They have lots of nice properties like this. Now, we can also write 5 to the power of 7 on 3, right? Because, well, you can always, you can always just calculate 5. To, what do I need to search to learn more about this? Um, look up Modular Arithmetic 101, basically. Um, there's also a lot of textbooks we'll cover this. Katz and Lindell is one that does a great job. So Katz and Lindell is a great textbook that will take you through some of this stuff from the beginning. So you could always calculate 5 to the power of 7, some humongous number, and then take the remainder divided by 3, but that's going to take forever. 
Remember what I said before, you can do the modulo first. So, well, 5 is 2, 7 is 1. So 2 to the power of 1, and this is going to be equal to 2. Walking cats on the desk, good textbook. Um, so you can, you can erase things to powers. Can you erase things to negative powers? Well, remember that... Um, Raising, thing to, raising something to a negative power is the same as going one over that. So we can divide, we can raise things to powers. It's just like a normal, it's just like working with normal integers, except we have this funny mod operation um, that lets us divide and still get a whole number at the end. So that's kind of, that's kind of nice. Um, I don't have time to talk about modular arithmetic in great detail, but it's good fun. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things to learn. Um, and this is the field of abstract algebra, is what we call it. So one more definition, this funky thing, ZP, I'm going to say, is equal to 0, 1, so on, up, into, up until P minus 1. And that's going to be the integers mod P. Because notice that 2 is equal to 5, equal to 8, equal to 11, mod, P, uh, mod 3. So if you, add the, if you add the modulus, you just get the same number after you do the modulus, right? So add 3, you always get the same number in the end. So we can only think, we, all, we only have to worry about the first P numbers when we're working mod P. And that's a symbol that I'm going to use a bunch of times. Alrighty, so now we come to uh, a nice application of these kinds of ideas. So we come to everyone's favourite problem, or maybe it's not your favourite problem, but it's one of my favourite problems, the discrete logarithm problem. So here's the deal. Let's say that you know g, y, and p, and you know that y is equal to g to the power of x mod p, and you don't know what x is. So you know that, you know that y is equal to g to the power of something mod p, but you don't know what that something is. This is called the discrete logarithm problem, um, because if you remember if you remember your high school maths, we can write log base a um, of a to the power of b equals a. Oh, sorry, b. Um, similarly, you can think about the discrete logarithm, which is like the logarithm, but you're working with integers instead, whole numbers. So the discrete logarithm problem, it turns out, um, as long as you're careful exactly how to, how to do it, there is no efficient algorithm. Okay. The discrete logarithm problem, or, well, ev everyone thinks it's hard. Now, maybe, maybe it's not hard. Um, maybe there's some secret that no one's discovered, but everyone's pretty sure the discrete logarithm problem is actually hard, um, unless you have a quantum computer, but I'm not even going to go there because um, no one has a quantum computer. Or if they do, the NSA is being very good at keeping it quiet. Um, so there's no efficient algorithm to solve this problem, uh, assu assuming you're careful about what numbers you choose. I'm not going to go into that because that's a huge rabbit hole. Um, and as soon as the cryptographer learns that there's no efficient algorithm to solve a problem, they get a bright idea. They, they think to themselves, well, if this problem's hard to solve, maybe I can use it to do cryptography. Hmm. So this is the idea behind um, a couple of crypto schemes. Uh, one's called Diffie-Hellman. Uh, Diffie-Hellman is how, when you connect to a website over HTTPS, it's how you and the server agree on a key. They use the Diffie-Hellman protocol, or maybe they use RSA, but they really shouldn't use RSA. Um, uh, there's also a scheme that I'm a particular fan of called AlGaml um, that uses the discrete logarithm problem to build a crypto system, okay? So here, the private key is going to be X. And... 
and the public key is going to be y. Right, so the idea is if you know the private key, you can easily take some number and raise it to that power. But if you, don't, if you only know the public key, it's going to be really hard to work out what the private key was. That's the basic idea. And I, I, know it's, I know it may not be obvious how you can do cryptography with that. That's a whole other talk that I did a few months ago. So unfortunately, I won't have time to go through it. But think of x as the private key and y as the public key in this equation. So remember the first sigma protocol I showed you. It's to do with proving that Alice really does know a secret key. Oops. One of the first zero-knowledge proofs, and one of the simplest, um, a sort of zero-knowledge, we'll come back to why it's not quite zero-knowledge later on. Um, here's how it works. So Alice knows uh, x, and she knows that y equals g to the x mod p. Bob knows... y, g, and p. Okay, so Alice, uh, so Alice knows this value of x, so um, y equals g to the power of x mod p. Bob knows all of the other parameters, but he doesn't know what x is. And Alice is going to prove to Bob that she really does know an, a corresponding x. So first of all, and remember the first step, in our original protocol, Alice sent the public key to Bob. Um, this time around, she's going to do something a little bit different. Um, and we still call this, we call this a commitment. Remember, Alice is committing to some fact to begin with. So Alice is going to choose some random number. And she's going to send del some thing w, which is going to be g to the power of r, to Bob. Okay, so... She has picked a random value and she's committed to that value. She's saying, I'm going to use this value for the rest of the proof. And she sends g to the power of r to Bob. Okay, that's the commitment. Wow, I can't spell. Step two, Bob is going to come up with a challenge. Okay, and that's just a random challenge, um, hopefully a very big one, um, just like in the other uh, protocol. And he's just going to send C straight up to Alice. Okay, and remember this step is called the, the challenge. Finally, Alice is going to compute some kind of funky value in one. Yeah, Alice only sends W to Bob, but Bob does know G. Okay, so Bob knows G, but Bob does not know R. Only sends W to Bob. Alice is going to set Z to be x plus c times r mod p. And she's going to send z to Bob. And this is our response, okay? So the response previously was to decrypt the challenge. In this case, the challenge isn't encrypted. So Alice is going to calculate some value and send it off to Bob. Now, I argue that if Alice does this, that constitutes a proof that she does know x. Why is that? Well, what does Alice, what does Bob have to do? What does Bob have to do now to check that Alice was honest? Well, if Bob calculates, let's take um, t, oh, what have I done? I meant to call this, I meant to call this t. My apologies. OK, 
Okay, she says the commitment t equals g to the r to the bob. So Bob's going to calculate t times y to the power of c mod p. Now, if Alice has done everything properly, what is this going to be? Well, t is g to the power of r. Remember, Bob doesn't know r, but he does know that t is equal to g to the power of r for some r. t is g to the power of r. y is g to the power of x. Again, Bob doesn't know x, but he does know that this fact should be true, which is equal to g to the power of r times g to the power of xc. Wow, I completely screwed this. I completely screwed that up, didn't I? <laughs> yes, I got that right. You can immediately see where I've gone wrong. Got these backwards. See, even even cryptographers who have spent the last 18, well, in my case, eight cryptography students who spent the 18, last 18 months of their life slaving over this garbage. Get it wrong. Okay, there we go. And this is gonna be g to the power of r times g to the power of x of x times c, which is the same thing as g to the power of r plus x c, which is g to the power of z, okay? So if Alice has done everything correctly, this is gonna be, this is gonna be a true fact. Now Bob knows this stuff, Bob knows Z, so he can calculate T to the power of, uh, T times Y to the power of C. He can calculate G to the power of Z, and he can check that they're equal. Okay, so Bob checks whether these things are equal. If they are, Bob says, okay, you really do know the X. Because how, how else could Alice, how else could Alice have gotten the answer right? She'd have to guess the relevant Z. She'd have to guess, without knowing x, she'd have to somehow guess a value of z that makes this whole thing true. Uh, and it turns out, you can study this mathematically, it turns out that it's actually quite hard to do so. Um, yeah, so I knew this question would come. Have I left off mod p on the right-hand side? Um, usually in cryptography, we just say mod p, and then it's always mod p. Uh, we only write mod p on one side, because otherwise our equations get really messy. So I've got this mod p equals this mod p, and then I have to write mod p here, blah, 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 mod p here. So usually we only write it once, and usually we write it at the end of the equation. Hope that makes sense. Um, is it also mod p in one? It, it can be, it doesn't have to be, because Bob can just calculate it, right? Bob can just take t and make it mod p. But yeah, everything is mod p here, all right? All of the operations are mod p. So Bob is checking this fact, t times y to the c equals g to the z. And there's a bunch of, that, that's, that, that's a bunch of heavy maths, but the outcome is, right, Bob knows for sure that either Alice really does know x or Alice got really lucky. So this is a proof. This is a proof that Alice really does know the corresponding x, right? So hopefully you believe me, this really is a proof, or at least if Alice knows the x, she can definitely come up with the answer, and it should be hard to guess. But you might be sitting there going, how do you actually know? Okay, we can make an argument that um, there, are, there are not many possible choices for z, and if, if Alice just guessed z, then she must have been really lucky. Okay, that, that seems like a believable argument, but if you're anything like me, you sort of go, uh, we should we should be really sure, right? We shouldn't we shouldn't just have to put it down to a vague argument. Well, look, it's probably hard to do, so that's enough. We should probably come up with some way to argue that um, Alice really must have known the correct value. So this is gonna this is where we're gonna start doing some magic. We're gonna start doing some really wacky stuff, and. The whole idea is kind of bent to begin with, because how are you supposed to prove that you know a secret without revealing any of that information? That The whole idea is silly to begin with. So the first idea we're going to think about is soundness. Um, my first question to you is, what does it mean to know something? Remember, what, the whole point is Alice is trying to prove that she knows a secret.
And this is kind of a deep question. Like, what does it really mean to know something? Do you, when you're thinking about a computer, does the computer has to have to have the value in memory? Um, how are we going to define this in some kind of useful way? So cryptography kind of takes, cryptography kind of dodges the question by asking another question. Cryptography says, well, Alice knows anything that she can compute. And we're excluding any kind of really hard problems. Um, if Alice has to spend a century processing to um, compute a thing, then she doesn't really know the thing. So we're only thinking about things that Alice can realistically efficiently compute. So we say Alice, okay, we're going to say that Alice knows anything that she can compute given her data. Um, define as can the expected result be obtained? I'm not sure what you're getting at with that, unfortunately. Uh, feel free to explain more. Um, we're going to say Alice knows anything that she can compute. But here's the thing. We don't trust Alice. How do we know if she can compute the thing or not? She can't... Like, how do we know that she's actually computing the thing? That's going to... That's going to bring us to our first magic trick. Right, okay, so can Alice give you the, the correct answer reliably? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a similar way to think about it. So the first trick we're going to play is extracting and rewinding. We're going to take, take Alice and force her to give, her, give up the secret. We're going to extract the secret from the things she tells us. So what are the things that we see? Okay, so Alice sends us a bunch of stuff. Alice, picks, uh, Alice sends us a T. Alice sends us a Z, and someone is going to send her a C. Maybe that's us, doesn't really matter. So I've got these values, T, C, and Z. Okay, I've run the proof, I've got a T, C, and I've got a commitment T, a challenge C, a response Z. Now we're going to rewind Alice. We're going to go back in time to the state where Alice had just sent us T. Okay, Alice has just sent us T, and now we're going to send her a new challenge, which is not equal to our previous challenge. And she's going to send us a response. She's going to send us a new response. She got a new challenge, right? And that gives us a new conversation, T, C prime, Z prime. Now, as long as both of these are legit proofs, this is where we're going to do the extraction. And I know you're already saying you can't just rewind Alice. We'll get to that. Okay. So we're now going to do the extraction because remember, we can divide. This is the key point. We can divide because P is prime. Okay. We know that G to the power of Z is equal to t times c to the power of y. And again, everything is mod p. We know that g to the power of z prime, well, that's a big prime, there we go, is t times c prime to the power of y. Again, mod p. What happens if we divide the equations? Okay, so we're going to divide the equations together. And then we get g to the power of z minus z prime. And this is going to be a bunch of algebra. And when I get to the end, um, you know, if our maths isn't your thing, just tune out. I'll get to the punchline soon. We're going to get um, g, to the g to the power of z minus z1 is equal to c to the power of y. Oh, I got that backwards. I'm so sorry. Apparently the dyslexia is real today. It's, of course, y to the power of c, right? Okay, so we know these facts must be true. And that's going to give us, well, divide through the t, g to the z minus z prime is y to the, z, to the c minus c prime. Again, mod p. I'm going to stop writing the mod p because my pen hand is going to get sore. So now, okay, what if we raise both sides to the inverse of this power? We want to get rid of this power because we want to figure out 
we want to figure out x. So we've got g to the power of something, and we want that to be equal to y. So we're going to raise both sides to the power of c minus c prime inverse. And remember, we can divide. There's always inverses because we've got a prime number. The c minus c prime and c minus c prime inverse cancel, and we get this equals y. And because we know that y is equal to g to the power of x, and again, we didn't know what x is, but now we do. g to the power of blah is equal to g to the power of x. So we know that x must be z minus z prime over c minus c prime, 1p. So by rewinding Alice and getting her to answer a different challenge, we managed to extract the secret. We got the secret out of Alice. I remember what I just said. Anything that Alice can efficiently compute counts as something that Alice actually knows. Alice answered two things, and we were able to, based on the information she gave us, we were able to figure out what X must have been. So Alice really must have known X. If Alice didn't know X, there's no way that she could answer twice. because we just calculated x from her two answers. So she must have known it. Either that, or she got extraordinarily lucky. And if she got lucky, well, she knows it now because she can calculate it now. So by doing this sort of thought experiment where we're imagining that Alice is a robot, we can go inside and rewind her back to before she answered our challenge. By imagining, doing this hypothetical experiment, we're shown we can actually extract the information we need out of the algorithm. And that's going to, that, we're going to say, that counts as Alice knowing it. Now, the, the key trick is, if you want to keep a secret, you must also hide it from yourself. Exactly. Exactly. So, okay, we've got Alice to answer two questions. And from that, we extracted the value of x. So she must have known it all along. Um, now, a little, a little side note is, this extraction that I did has to be polynomial time because obviously I could have just taken every possible number, tried g to the power of that to figure out x. Um, we could have done that, but you know we're going to require that the extraction is in polynomial time because otherwise we can do it no matter what. All right. Now you might be thinking, well, if we ex if we pulled that information, we've pulled x out of two conversations with Alice. Does that mean that it's not actually zero knowledge? Does that mean that by talking to Alice, I somehow have leaked some information about X. Well, that's our next magic trick. So we've done, we've done soundness. We're sure that Alice really must know X. So the next thing we ask ourselves How are we supposed to be sure that we didn't, we're not leaking information? How are we supposed to know that for real? Well, again, we're gonna we're gonna dodge the question. <laughs> so, the cryptographic idea is: here's what we're gonna say. Imagine you could simulate a conversation. You don't imagine if imagine you never had to talk to Alice. You only ever had to simulate conversations with Alice. If you can simulate it so that you always get a valid proof out of the end, then you wouldn't have learned anything by spying on an Alice's conversations because you could have just simulated the conversation. There's no point spying on Alice doing all the work if you could have just simulated the conversation yourself. So we're gonna say that something is zero knowledge um, if there's a simulator that we could have talked to. If there's a simulator that we could have talked to instead of talking to Alice, then we can't have learned anything from spying on Alice because we could have just simulated it anyway. And this is the second magic trick.
Alrighty. So let's imagine that we're trying to, we know, again, remember, we know that y is equal to g to the power of x mod p. We don't know x. Um, and we want to simulate a conversation. Well, we we're supposed to have g to the power of z equals t times y to the power of c. Again, mod p. I'm just going to leave it out. Okay. We're supposed to have this, and we know, we know what y is, we know what g is. Well, what if we just cheated? What if we just say, what if we set t to be g to the power of r times y to the power of minus c? Uh, this is where there's a mistake in my proofs. This should be t, uh, t to the power of z. So there's a mistake in my notes that I will fix later. Okay, we can pick any we can pick any value of z that we like. Just pick some z, and now we've constructed a proof. Now I've constructed a proof, right? We've constructed this conversation. Constructed this conversation of a challenge, of a commitment, a challenge, and a response. And this is going to check out because t satisfies exactly the thing that it's supposed to. So we could have just simulated the conversation instead of talking to Alice. And that's what we're going to, that's how we're going to argue that this really is zero knowledge, that we didn't leak any information. Now there's a hole in this argument. If anyone can think of it before I explain it in a second, you get a cookie. There's a hole in this argument and the hole is to do with the value of C. So here we're, we're thinking about eavesdropping. Here we're thinking about the case where you're eavesdropping on Alice. But what if Bob is in on it? What if Bob wants to give Alice exactly the right bunch of challenges um, that just happen to make Alice accidentally reveal her value? So this is what we call... Um, this, is, this is not actually zero knowledge. This is what we call... It's going to be a mouthful, sorry about that. Special, honest verifier zero knowledge can't spell knowledge and of course because we're cryptographers we have to have a fancy acronym for it um special just means sigma protocols do some kind of funky stuff so we'll call it special because it's a little bit different to other protocols Honest verify means we're trusting Bob. We're assuming that Bob is not running some malicious scam to pull the value out of Alice. And then you might go, well, what's what's even the point? If, if, if we can manipulate Alice into giving her value, then it's obviously not zero knowledge. And again, we can get back to this idea. If you want to keep a secret, you must hide it from yourself. So this is our last trick, and this is our, the last segment of uh, the lecture for today. And again, you're, you're going to see a pattern here. We're going to dodge the question again. So here's how we're going to do it. Um, something that I don't have time to go through um, is what's called an OR proof. Uh, it's a fact that given y equals g to the x mod p, and y prime equals g to the power of x prime mod p, you can prove that you know of either one of them. So you can prove that you know one of them, but not which one you know, okay? So this is a thing you can prove. You can prove that you definitely know one of them um, without giving any information away about which one. And we're gonna we're gonna use this to cheat. So we're gonna take our Schnorr proof of knowledge, the proof that we know x. We're gonna take that 
and turn it into something that really must be zero knowledge. Um, and it's going to be kind of silly, but believe me, it makes sense. So Bob is, um, first of all, Bob is going to pick a random X prime. And he's going to compute, he's going to set uh, Y prime to be, uh, sorry, G to the power of X prime. And he's going to send Y prime to Alice. And he's going to prove that he knows X prime. Uh, we covered this, is he's just going to use the existing proof that we've already got to prove that he knows X prime. Alice is going to respond. Um, if the proof is correct, she's going to prove knowledge of X or X prime. Now you might be going, well, hang on a second. How could Alice possibly know X prime? It's a zero knowledge proof that Bob used to prove that he knew X, uh, X prime. That's exactly the point. If Alice proves knowledge of X or X prime, then we can use our simulator to extract X prime from Bob and then prove knowledge of X prime. So the simulator is going to prove that Alice, um, the simulator of this conversation is going to prove knowledge of X prime. And notice that the simulator doesn't touch X. The simulator gives you absolutely no information about X. Okay, by, by proving knowledge of X prime instead of X, you're using zero information about proof, which implies that the whole thing really must be zero knowledge. Um, obviously this is a sketch of a proof. The details get very hairy very fast. Uh, at the end of my notes, I've added some links for further reading. Um, you can spend weeks and weeks and months studying this kind of thing. So here's a recap. We wanted to prove that we knew some kind of secret, maybe the corresponding private key given a public key, or we wanted to prove that we, um, we made a correct transaction on a blockchain. We wanted to prove that when we tallied people's votes, we didn't mess with any of the votes. Um, we wanted to prove that we really did place a particular bid in an auction without revealing the, what the bid was. These are all um, really important modern use cases of zero knowledge proofs. Um, we went through, we looked at a concrete example of one particular proof. Um, in this case, the proof of knowledge with discrete logarithms. Um, and then we talked about how we're gonna actually prove that we have the properties we want to have. Uh, we saw three magic tricks. The first trick was we're gonna rewind Alice and extract the information from her. The second trick was we're gonna simulate the conversation so you never had to listen to Alice in the first place. The third trick was we're gonna use this or proof, proving that we know one of two facts so that we can simulate the whole thing without ever using anything to do with X. And that was the argument that we really did have a sound zero knowledge proof. Um, that's, all, that's all for the theory tonight. Um, I find this kind of stuff super fascinating because the problem sounds impossible to solve, but you can do it. Um, and the way that you do it is using all of these clever little tricks to avoid answering difficult questions like, what does it mean to know something? Well, I don't care what it means to know something. If you know it, if, if you can calculate it, then you know it. Um, this is a really fascinating field of study. Um, it's really influential in modern computer science, uh, modern cryptography. Um, and it's one of the things that I've enjoyed researching the most in my degree. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I know this, this is like really complicated and strange, um, but hopefully I've at least, um, given you some kind of interest um, in the field.
Uh, we, we can look at, I can look at this question that SK gave. Working on a simple client server application. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, conversation and chat seem to address that question. How do we get started with crypto? Um, I was interested, I, I've been interested in privacy and security because um, it's kind of like a it's, a, it's a, it's a game of cat and mouse, right? And it's to do with both sides trying to outsmart the other. And you get this really neat arms race where um, the black hat is trying to hide from the white hat. Um, and the white hat is developing better and better techniques. So you end up developing this, um, this really, this really inter interesting um, game, this, uh, this arms race game. And I found that really interesting. Um, and then I went and talked to a few professors that I knew at Melbourne Uni Computer Science. Um, I was referred to one particular professor. Um, I, I was, after you know talking to a few, I was referred to Professor Vanessa Teague. I think associate professor. Anyway, um, I was referred to Vanessa Teague, and she had an interesting project for me to do with uh, voting. Um, particular, in particular. Online voting kind of sucks. So how can we make online voting more? How can we make verifiable voting more like paper voting? Um, and as I dug into the theory that um, she dropped in a huge pile in front of me, um, cryptography became more and more interesting. I'd always been curious about it, but it was like, how do I get started? How do I actually, you know, do anything with this knowledge? Um, and that was the spark I needed. Um, thinking about the application to uh, voting um, to elections, which obviously are vitally important um, for all of us. Um, yeah, that really that really ignited a passion, and then I did a whole bunch of reading, um, and now I, I I'm currently reading like three or four crypto papers and books, and I don't know what to do with myself. What do I think of ECC and quantum computing safe cryptography? Uh, ECC is cool. Um, so ECC is an elliptic curve. Um, interestingly, it's the same problem, okay? You can use elliptic curve cryptography to do the same thing as all of this discrete log stuff. It turns out, um, if you, if you have points A and B on a elliptic curve, an elliptic curve is something that looks kind of like this, okay? If you have a point here, if you have a point here, say, A, and a point over here, say, B, um, and the equation of this is going to look something like y squared equals x cubed. Okay, if you know, if you have two points on a curve, it turns out you can actually define some sort of sensible notion of adding and multiplying these points. Um, and this is exactly equivalent to something like a to the power plus p to the b to the power of x in what we've been discussing before. Oh, sorry, a times b to the power of x. So elliptic curve cryptography, by this like wild coincidence, turns out to be exactly the same as this domain of um, discrete logarithms. And the cool thing about elliptic curves is they're a lot more time and space efficient. So the theory is super interesting. Um, I haven't read a ton of it, but um, yeah, I thoroughly enjoy reading about it. The next part of the question was quantum computing safe or post-quantum crypto. So there are two, there's sort of two key aspects. Um, so a quantum computer, Instead of using ordinary bits, it uses quantum bits or qubits, which are in a superposition of zero and one. So instead of being either zero or one, they look like alpha times zero plus beta times one. And it turns out that this structure and the operations you get out of that um, can do a lot of interesting things and it can solve problems. We think it can solve problems faster than so-called classical computer could. Now, there are two key algorithms. There's one called Shor's algorithm and there's one called um, Grover Search. So Shor's algorithm breaks RSA 
Um, it turns out it also breaks the discrete log problem. It, you can adapt Shaw's algorithm to solve the discrete log problem, and therefore it also breaks Diffie-Hellman um, for air, L-gamel, and so on. Grover search is kind of this funky algorithm where you've got some unknown function and you're going to try to guess what the function must have been. And the most important thing that it breaks is what's called AES, which is the most common um, symmetric cipher, which means it breaks AES, so it has to break. It also breaks HTTPS as a result. So these two algorithms, and I want to stress there's no practical realistic quantum computer out there yet, um, but if quantum computers become reliable and large enough, uh, all of these algorithms are completely toast. Completely toast, easy to break. Um, so there's been this kind of race to come up with, with algorithms that are resistant to this kind of thing. Um, the most promising candidate from what I've read is Lattice Crypto. And this uses an algebraic idea called lattices. They're quite complicated. The theory is very involved. I don't know much about it. Um, but from what I've read, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, basically, it, 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 it isn't broken because you're not just trying to solve a problem. You're trying to find a good solution to a problem. And that's what makes it hard to break. Um, there's this lovely guy, Ron Steinfeld. At Monash, who... Um, has done a whole bunch of research into lattice space crypto. It's a lot of interesting uh, papers to read. Um, that you can also do some kind of funky things with quantum crypto that you can't do with classical crypto. So for example, um, it's possible using quantum techniques, it's possible to send a message and guarantee that the message wasn't intercepted along the way. Um, because if it was intercepted, it would, it would air quotes collapse the superposition and you would end up with a result that was unintelligible. So you can actually detect uh, message interception using some of those ideas, which is really cool. Um, not something I've studied much of, but really interesting. And there's a there's a link to something, scythe.com, I haven't looked at it myself. Cool. Any Anything else people would like to ask about? Well, thanks for watching, everyone. Um, I hope you, based on something called castle, I'm not familiar with the term, unfortunately. Um, I hope you learned something kind of interesting about the modern state of cryptography. Um, and there's a question from FooCrypt that I'll get to in a second. Um, there's this really, it, I, I find this area really fascinating. It sounds like you shouldn't be able to do it, but you can. Um, and there's mountains and mountains of theory to uh, learn about how all of this works. And in particular, what I really enjoy is these weird tricks that we pull in order to be able to prove that we can actually do solve these problems. I find that really interesting, um, this outside the box thinking. It uses, oh, good Lord. Uh, sure. It uses a whole bunch of stuff that is normal. Um, so X25519 is a classic. Um, signature algorithm, Chow Chow 20 is a classic stream cipher. Argon, Argon 2ID is a classic password hash algorithm. Sha 512 is a classic general hash algorithm. Um, yeah, that, that all, that's all stuff that we normally use. Um, free crypto, how do I feel about the application of 4D geometry to crypto? Um, well, I mean, This whole, all of this stuff is related to the field of linear algebra. Um, it's kind of a fundamental part of linear algebra. And what's interesting about doing linear algebra in four dimensions, for some reason, four dimensions behave really, really weirdly. Five, six, seven, eight dimensions behave much more nicely. For some, for whatever reason, mathematically, four dimensions has a whole bunch of weird stuff and a whole bunch of special cases, um, a nice, a nice thing to read about is, um, uh, I am blanking, the Poincaré conjecture, or now, now it's the Poincaré theorem because it was proved. Um, it, that's an, just one example of how stuff gets weird in four dimensions. Um, I haven't read about 
the specific use of um, hypercubes in crypto, um, but I can totally see how those ideas could be interesting. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for coming along and have a good night, everyone. Um, hit me up on Twitter if you want to chat more.